This was the last round of a big open tournament in Chicago in May of 1998. My opponent, Larry Christensen, is one of America's most talented grandmasters. Actually, about two years before we played this game, Larry and I met up in Amsterdam and spent four or five days studying chess. I was traveling through Europe, sitting in the cafes, watching life, and writing about the beautiful women. Larry was fed up with America, I guess, and was living in Germany. It was an amazing experience, I tell you. We would spend eight hours a day studying crazy chess positions in a little room at the Hotel Schmidt, a few blocks away from Irvis Square. Larry blew me away with his creativity and attacking spirit. He's a powerful analyst. And we would take long walks and argue. Larry would tell me about the conspiracies of the world, the emptiness of Siddhartha and Jack Kerouac, and how the liberals were destroying everything. I would lash back about great literature and Zen Buddhism while he rolled his eyes. We clashed pretty intensely, but I learned a lot from Larry. Anyway, this game years later was for all the money. The winner would tie for first place, the loser would be depressed, and a draw would knock us both out of contention. I believe that the tournament setting in those days in Amsterdam had a large effect on what went down on the chessboard. I was white and played E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Knight C3, Knight F6, G3. You probably remember this opening from my game against Blotney. He played bishop c5, as did Blotney. Bishop g2, d6, d3. It's interesting because I've won three big games with the white pieces in this game against very strong players in the last rounds of big tournaments for, the, for first place. The opening is psychologically quite difficult to play with black when black needs to win because it looks as if white isn't playing for anything but in fact white is playing for a very small advantage. And this brings about a very important psychological reality in chess. How do you play in a game where you absolutely must win, when drawing isn't an option? Many people's inclination is to play all out aggressively, try to make things very complicated, try to go after the guy right away. But the problem is that when you're playing against a very strong player, you have to play the right moves, and you have to play within your style. Because if you play too aggressively, or you play moves that aren't necessarily the best way, then your, your position will simply get worse and you'll lose. So there are two different times. Sometimes both players need to win the game. And sometimes one guy needs to win, one guy is happy to play for the draw. And that's the most difficult. And in fact, I, I recently lost a big game when I needed to win and my opponent was content with the draw and I had an even position with the black pieces. I was playing a strong international master and I, I was rejecting equality when the position was even. I was playing to win, playing to win. And I got myself into huge time pressure, spending all my time trying to figure out how to be active. Well, in fact, the best thing to do is to simply play the best moves, let the position emerge slowly. In the Kasparov-Karpov match, I believe in 1983, the last game, game 24, Kasparov had to win the game to win the world championship match. And it was a beautiful game in which he maintained the tension of the position on and on. And that's pr probably the best example of how to play when your opponent absolutely is playing for a draw and you must win. Just play a normal game, and keep the tension in the position alive. So in this game, that's how I played. And my opponent, on the other hand, was trying from the beginning to mix things up. He was trying to be aggressive, to, to be unorthodox when it was unnecessary. And you'll see that in a few moves. So now my opponent played a6, because you recall from my discussion of the Blotney game, my threat was knight a4 to win the two bishops. I castled. And he played h6 which stops bishop g5 later on and also stops knight g5 if he's going to put a bishop on e6. You probably recall that back in this position, Blatney tried the strange idea of bishop g4, and after I played h3, he played bishop e6, with the idea of keeping queen d7 later on will be attacking the pawn. And here I played king h2, he played h6, and I played bishop e3. And then Blatney played bishop takes e3, f takes e3, d5, and that interesting game emerged from this position. So Christensen played it a little differently. He played h6, which is a useful move because it stops my bishop g5 later on, or maybe if he wants to put a bishop on e6 and I would play knight g5. Now, I know you've heard me say in my lessons that it's very important not to move pawns in the area where your king is going to be because that weakens the king. It exposes a weakness. But h6, in fact, isn't a weakness because if his king goes kingside, as it probably will if he castles, the h6 pawn is very useful here, because the g5 square is important for me, and it's not so weak. Now, if, on the other hand, he had a pawn on g6 and a pawn on h7, then his dark squares around the king would be very weak. So, to every rule, there's an exception, and it's very important to know. Moves like h6 around the king are only weakening 
if I have a pawn storm developing. For example, if I were to have my pawn on g4 and on h4 and I was about to play g5 and I had a rook on the g file, for example, something like this, then the h6 pawn would provide a weakness and then after g5 he would be able to take and take and the open h file I could use later maybe. h6 is only a weakness in terms of my attack if I have a pawn storm developing. Otherwise, against pieces, it's just simply a very useful move. I can't utilize the weakness. The only way to use, in fact, the weakness of h6 with my pieces is to have a knight on f5 and a queen on f3. And I, my point being that he can't play g6 to kick out the knight because then the h6 pawn will hang. And that's pretty much the only way with my pieces I can use this weakness in this pawn structure. So h6 is a good move to stop my ideas, and in fact, it's not terribly weakening of his king's side. So after h6, I play bishop b3. He castled, and I played a move similar to my ideas in Blotny. I played h3, with the idea of slowly building up on the king's side. White wants to eventually play a move like f4, so my idea is going to be to play king h2, knight h4, eventually play f4, and start the attack. It's very important for you to know that you might be thinking, what a, wait a minute, White can play bishop takes c5, d takes c5, and mess up his pawn structure. In fact, this won't mess up his pawn structure, because... Although he does have double pawns, he has control of the d-file, he has total control of the d4 square, and now he has all the central mobility. His pawn can come up c4 later on, undermine my center. So this would be a mistake for me to do this, to play with the structure. If I could have done this with a knight, for example, play knight a4 takes c5, it would be different, because then I would have two bishops. But in the position with bishop e3, I want him to take on e3, and he wants me to take on c5. Whoever maintains the tension most effectively will get the advantage. And here, I believe the psychology started to make itself felt. He played bishop d7, which is simply a strange move. It's not an orthodox move. The bishop, after, especially after the h6 move was played, belongs on e6 for many reasons. First of all, it's the most natural developmental move. It controls the d5 square, so later on he may want to play d6 to d5. It keeps the d7 square for his queen, queen d7. It keeps the, knight, the square for the knight, knight d7. All these ideas are natural. Bishop e6 has no drawbacks, and it's the best square for the bishop. I think part of the reason that he played bishop d7 is because he knew he had to win this game, and he simply wanted to make things off balance. He wanted to make things strange, unorthodox. And this is typical when you must win. Sometimes people, if they have to win, they play moves that they wouldn't normally play. But the thing to understand is that a strong grandmaster would normally play certain moves because... They're the best moves. If he doesn't make the moves that are natural to him, he's not playing up to his strength. And a lot of the time, if you, you, you'll be in a position where you have to win a certain game, and drawing is not an option. And what I recommend to you then, play the best move. Don't worry about the result. In chess almost always, or in any form of competition, when you start thinking about the result, it takes you out of the moment, and you start making moves which aren't so strong. So I think bishop d7 was an example of Larry trying to play strange moves too early. He should have maintained the natural flow of the position. Of course, it is possible that he has a very profound idea that I simply don't understand and that didn't emerge in the game, but I, I, I don't think so. I just think bishop d7 is, is incorrect. So here I continue with my natural plan of king h2, just eyeing the h3 square. In this kind of position with a closed center, white can take his time building. I want to slowly build up my position. I played king h2, and now he played bishop takes e3, which is what I wanted him to play. f takes e3, knight e7. Now, there's no question Larry Christensen is a very, very strong chess player. I have great respect for him. And he's playing a little bit unnaturally. And I think a big part of it has to do with the fact that, yes, this is the last round, but he's played a lot of last rounds. I also think it has to do with the fact that, you know, when we met in Amsterdam, when we did this big analysis together... You know, he was a strong grandmaster, and I was a young international master. I was very honored to be able to work with him. I was learning a lot from him. He was kind of in the role of the teacher, the older, wiser chess player, and he definitely was that. In this game, I think he felt a little bit of a burden. He felt tremendous pressure to show his superiority over the board, and this was a dangerous thing for him to do because he didn't play so naturally. The plan of knight e7 is, is of course, quite normal. You want to put the knight on e7 to guard the f5 square, it would be better with his bishop on e6 because he'd have more control over the d5 square and also his queen could come out. So knight e7 is natural, but his play feels a little bit disjointed to me. For example, bishop takes e3 wasn't forced. There was no reason for him to do it right away, except for the fact that I'm sure Larry's thinking was he wants to play knight e7. And if he plays knight e7 now, I play bishop takes c5, dc5, knight takes e5. 
So if he's going to play with 97, he does have to play it right away. But my feeling is that Black's play isn't harmonious. He's not playing naturally, and I think the psychology of the situation had a lot to do with that. And here I used a similar idea that I used in the Blotney game. I played knight h4, idea being knight f5. After knight h4, I have a lot of interesting ideas, one of which is to sacrifice an exchange. I, I might play rook takes f6. This idea is hanging in the air. And this was a theme that was prevalent through this game. Consistently, I developed threats that weren't necessarily immediately threats, but the fact that it was hanging in the air caused him to defend, and then I took advantage of the move he made to defend against my fake threat or my pseudo-threat. So here, rook takes f6 might have been an idea. For example, rook takes f6, g takes f6, queen h5. I forced a weakening, next move by play rook f1. Maybe this is an idea of mine, maybe not, unclear. But because it was in the air, he played knight h7, moved knight away, which is a good flexible defensive move. And here I brought my knight into the game, knight f5, which is a very strong square for the knight. Now, as I mentioned before, he can't play moves like g6 to kick it out, because the h6 pawn will hang. So the only way he can ever remove that piece is by taking it off with another piece. And my bishop on g2, which is blocked, will then become very strong. But in fact, he won't have much of a choice. My, if I play moves like queen g4, I'm going to get a building attack. But probably my next move will simply be rook f2, after which I'll move my queen, rook will come to f1. The fact that my knight is on f5 will be very unpleasant for him, so he decided to get rid of it. Knight takes f5, e takes f5, and the bishop comes alive. So now we have a position which is not so different from the ideas of the Blotney game. My bishop has come alive with e takes f5. I want to slowly attack his king. Now, in the Blotney game, his king was in the middle of the board and wasn't clear which way it was going to go. Now his king is on the king's side, I know that. So probably my plan will involve a slow build-up with like g4, something h4, g5. I'd like to do this whenever I can. It's not so easy. And as we know, the most natural thing to do when your opponent is attacking on one side of the board is to counterattack in the center. And Larry played that idea. He played c6. So we know what his next move is, d5. He wants to take the center. So now try to find White's move. The idea we consistently use when attacking is combining our attacking plan with stopping our opponent's dangerous ideas. I have no reason to allow him to take the center with d5. Then he'll have quick central counterplay and I'll have no time for my kingside expansion. So I stopped it, e4. Now d5, of course, is impossible because I defend it plenty of times. And now he began on the queen side, b5. The other natural counterplay. Attacked on the king side, counterattack on the queen side. So here we have a position where white wants to gradually build up g4. I want to put a queen on g3 probably. I want to play h4. Maybe I want to put a rook on h1. Bring, bring my king back. Slowly build up with g5. I have lots of plans. Maybe a rook on g1. Move my bishop to h3. Play g5 this way. There are a lot of ideas I have, but it's all very slow. The winner of this game will be the guy who succeeds in getting his plan done while keeping the other guy a little slower than he wants to be. b5 has the idea of advancing with b4. I mentioned that my plan is to play g4 and eventually put a queen on g3. That's the first step of my plan. This game is different from most of the games that I've discussed because most of them were open games, exciting positions in which the center was open, pieces were flying in different directions. This has a slightly different feeling. This is much more of a strategical game, at least this part of it is. White is slowly building up on the king's side, black on the queen's side. And in strategical games with closed centers, a key is to think in plans, not just moves, but in plans and schemes. So, and and you, you plan your setup. So my, I, I have a vision. Probably the ideal vision for white would be the pawn on g4, the queen on g3, the pawn on h4, the bishop on h3, the rook on g1, and then to play g5 and to go after the king. That's probably white's idea. So now that we have that vision, in what order should we, do, should we play these moves? Well, Black's idea is to play b4, attack my knight, and start to attack on the queen side if he can. He also wants to try to undermine the d5 square. So the first move that I made was queen e1. Just a simple move, preparing my queen to come to the g3 square after I play g4, and also hitting the b4 square. If he plays b4, after knight e2, the pawn will be attacked. Also notice that if I had played g4 right away, he could have played the strong move queen h4, sticking his queen into the middle of my game, and I have no way of getting rid of it without trading queens. I don't want to play queen one and trade off queens because in this position I have the idea of attacking his king when attacking the king is best if the queens are on the board. So g4 would be in an accurate order because after queen h4, 
it's a real tough thing for me to develop my attack. Next move notice his knight might come to g5. Now he has total dark square control. My bishop is going to start looking bad soon. Very important when you have a plan to accomplish it in the correct move order. And the way you can usually decide your correct move order is to look for your opponent's counter chances. So my first move is queen e1, eyeing the b4 square and eyeing the h4 square. And now Larry played a move which is quite typical of him. He's a very creative player, and he also was thinking in schemes. We know what my idea was, and his idea is to slowly build up in the queen side the center. He played the move rook a7. Typical of a very creative guy like Larry, he often makes moves which other people wouldn't even consider. His plan is to play d5, so his next few moves are probably going to be bishop c8, rook to d7, bishop b7, then maybe I'll kick out my knight and play d5. That's his plan. It's pretty logical. If he op succeeds in opening up the center, then he can get counterplay, and my kingside play won't be so good. Also notice that if he succeeds in opening up the center, and I've done some kingside pushing, it can be very bad for me, because if the whole center of the board opens up, my king will be loose with my pawns forward. So the only way that my kingside play will really work is if I succeed in stopping his central play, at least slowing it down enough. So, he played rook a7, we see what his plan is. What do you do now with white? I decided to continue with my plan. I played g4. We know his move, bishop c8. Both players have plans. What would you play now? Well, we know I want to play queen g3. But we also know that b4 is part of his plan. And if my knight moves with the queen on e1, the b4 pawn is attacked. You'll have to take a tempo to defend it. So probably this isn't the best move right away. I played rook g1 keeping the queen on a good flexible square where it eyes the b4 pawn, and beginning the plan of eventually h4, bishop moves, and defending the g5 square. We know his plan, rook d7. Also, notice, my queen is important defending against the d5 move also because I, I hit the e5 square. My queen will take the pawn later on. So after rook d7, I play queen g3. My next move will be h4, probably. So d5 right away is bad because queen takes e5 simply wins a pawn. As is b4, knight moves, d5, the pawn is attacked. And in this position, I, I think that Larry went wrong. I think white is slightly better. I do have a strong plan of developing my kingside initiative. But it's not clear how far I'll go. A very important part of defensive chess is visualizing the development of your opponent's plan. And then seeing three or four moves down the line, how to stop it. For example, if I play h4 in this kind of structure... It's very difficult for me to defend the g5 square again. g5 takes, takes, knight takes g5 will be very good for black. So if my opponent were to wait, it'll be quite difficult. I'm going to have to eventually maneuver my knight all the way to the f3 square, and in that time he can try to play for d5. So if my opponent were to play slowly, visualizing the difficulty I might have later on, it might make the game very difficult. But Larry saw that my plan was to play h4, and he stopped it with g5. And this was an example of my having a threat. Maybe a threat, maybe not a threat. I had a plan for sure, but now I take advantage of his defensive move to re-energize my attack. G5 does succeed in stopping the pawn storm of H4 and G5 later on, but on the other hand, it gives me a new weakness to key in on. The G5 pawn will help me open up the H file later on. So my plan now is going to be to get my king out of the way, pile up, for instance, with bishop f3, king g2, rook h1. I might even put book both rooks on the H file and then play h4, bust open the h-file and go for it. I have a new weakness to key in on. I think that g5 was a rather large inaccuracy. It stopped a plan that did not need to be stopped right away. Larry should have continued to build up his counterplay, probably with bishop b7. Continue to try with for the d5 plan. Let me go on the king's side. He'll play in the center. Probably white is slightly better. f6 should be part of black's plan, but the game is very, very unclear. What would you play now with white? We don't want to rush things. i got to get my king out of the way, like I said. Bishop f3. I'm playing with a lot of flexibility here. My king will move. I'm going to start along the h-file. He played bishop b7. Once again, preparing d5, which isn't possible right away because the e5 pawn is still hanging. King g2. White slowly builds up. After king g2, he played f6, which combines his attacking idea of d5. He's defending the e5 pawn with a defensive idea of solidifying the g5 square and the h7 knight. When he played this move, I wasn't sure that it was good. I, I was actually quite happy to see it. 
because I thought that his queen occupying these dog squares, for instance, the f6 square or the g5 square after h4 has been played, might be useful for him. But he, it's an interesting idea, and, and he liked it. He played f6. So now we see Black's idea is to play d5. But also his idea is to play queen b6, to take this diagonal. This is a very important diagonal later on, especially if the center is opening up. So here I combined, again, a defensive idea with a potential attacking idea for my attack. I played queen f2. Stopping queen b6, there's no way for him to defend the b6 square again for a long time. And also I'm opening up the g3 square, because later on my knight might play knight e2 to g3 to h5, and in fact it does. So combining prophylaxis against queen b6 with a potential knight maneuver for the attack. And again, my idea is to build up on the king side, rook h1. So after queen f2, he played rook ff7. He's preparing to defend. What would you play with white? Rook h1, begin the build-up. He played rook g7. Now your, your inclination might be to continue with rook h2, rook h1, or to play immediately h4, and both these ideas are possible. But his rook on g7 has just exposed itself to my knight on h5, which is important. I decided to take advantage of it. I played knight e2. There's no reason for me to rush. In these types of positions where one side has a superior plan to the other side, because his central play is not doing anything, even if he were to get in d5 now, his next move isn't clear. If he takes an e4, I can simply take back. Black's not really getting anywhere. White, on the other hand, has big attacking chances. I want to play knight g3, knight h5. I want to play h4. Black has a lot more to worry about, so there's no reason for me to give him anything specific to deal with right away. Let the anxiety build and continue to improve my position. He played queen a5. His threat is pretty clear. He wants to play queen d2, put the queen into my into my game, attacking the c-pawn. There's no reason for me to allow that. The queen's just a nuisance there. I played knight g3, continuing with my plan, defending the square. And now he played c5. So finally, black has found a useful way to attack my queen side. He wants to play c4, try to open up the c-file and get counterplay. But now I've gained a lot of time in my attack. What do you play with white? It looks like my knights come from c3 to e2 to g3 because it has the idea of going to h5. Why not do it right away? That's one way of approaching the position, but on the other hand, we want to maintain as much potential as we can. In these types of positions, these closed games, where I have a number of ideas in which I'm using it once, it's good to sometimes hold them in your hand. Keep the ideas as potential. Knight h5 would just attack the rook. It would move away, but it'll be very useful later on. Now it was time to open things up. I played h4. He immediately began his queenside play, c4. If he takes on h4, rook takes h4 will be devastating. The h6 pawn is, is impossible to defend. So now, when the position is becoming critical for black, he's starting his counterplay. The rook on g7 might be good if the g-file opens up, and he wants to open up things on the queen side, get started quickly. I played h takes g5. And here Larry made another move which is typical of himself. He's a very dynamic player, he's very creative, he loves to attack, and he sacrificed a pawn with knight takes g5, giving up the h6 pawn. If he had taken on g5 with the h pawn, it would have been pretty ugly, because his knight on h7 can't move, he's all pinned down, it's very passive, and it's not in his style. Let's analyze this a little bit. I would have played rook h6. My idea is two things. First of all, I want to pile up with rook a to h1, start the attack. The other point, which is my real point, is I want to play knight h5. Now I'll be attacking his rook and the pawn on f6, plus my rook on h6 can remove his defender, rook takes h7 at any point. It's very dangerous for him. After rook h6, what my idea is, let's say he plays rook c7. I would play knight h5, and after rook f7, I would play rook a to h1. The fact that my pawn on a2 is hanging is irrelevant. Things are happening very quickly on the king's side. If he plays c takes d3, c takes d3, queen takes a2, white to play and win. What do you do? Rook takes h7, wins the game. He has two possibilities, king takes h7 or rook takes h7. If rook takes h7, I simply play knight takes f6 check, king h8, rook takes h7, rook takes h7, knight takes h7, king takes h7. It looks like the position is simplifying, but here I have the devastating move, queen b6, which wins the game. After queen b6, the only way he can defend his bishop is with queen f7. But then I play queen takes d6. I'm taking yet another pawn. The e5 pawn is going and black is completely lost. If instead of rook takes h7, he plays king takes h7, I have the 
Discover double check. Knight takes f6 check. King g7. Now what do you do with white? Knight e8 check. Continue the attack. He's got to go to g8. And now I don't take the rook right away. I play the quiet move. Queen d2. Attacking the g5 pawn. And this is winning. If he plays rook g7, defending it, all his rooks are hanging. I can take on c7, followed by taking on g5. Or I could play the move f6. He's completely lost. And I play rook takes h6. And here we see that the game has changed character drastically and quickly. The game was a slow, positional game. It seemed like I was watching what he was doing. I had some long-term plans. He was watching what I was doing, trying to play in the center, trying to play in the queen side. But now, I've busted open the king side. He sacrificed a pawn to get an active knight. His rook is on the open g file. He's trying to bust open the queen side. Things look very, very tight. This is the part of the game where it's important to be the most accurate tactically. And it's very complicated, so here we'll analyze some of the variations, try to come to understand them. After rook takes h6, he played knight takes f3. Another thematic try he had was d5. Try to break open the center. Unfortunately, he doesn't have time for it. I would simply play knight h5. And after d takes e4, knight takes f6 check. King f7. I have two options. One is that I can take the e4 pawn because my knight f6 defends it. And now I can simply take his rook. Knight takes d7. After e takes f3, king h1, he has no way to continue with his attack. I'm up in exchange. His king is being attacked. e5 check is hanging. He's lost. If he plays c takes d3, I have two options. I can take back on d3, which is also winning. Pretty complicated, but also winning. Or I can play the move knight h5, just simply attacking. After he plays knight takes e4, I can play bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4, king h2, temporarily giving up some material. But now there's no way for black to defend against knight takes f6 check. So after knight takes f3, what would you play with white? This is the critical moment of the game. All the money's on the line. Take your time. I played knight h5 and went after him. Notice the timing of this position. If black takes a move and tries to defend, for example, with something like rook gf7, I can either take on f6 with my knight or I can simply take back on f3 because the tempo he lost on the defense gives me too much time. I can take on f6 next move. So black can't afford to take a move to defend. And knight h5 is devastating. Take a moment tactically, work it all out. If he plays rook takes g4, then I simply take back. King takes f3. I'm attacking the rook with my king, and knight takes f6 check is next. Take some time now and calculate everything out. Make sure it makes sense to you. He played c takes d3. Tried to open things up. It won't be so good for me if I allow his bishop to come to e4. But he has no time for it. Knight takes f6 check. Boom. I'm temporarily down a piece. But his king is getting attacked. Big time. King f7. So now his knight on f3 is hanging and his rook on d7 is hanging. What would you do? You might want to take the bigger piece, but that would be a big mistake. After knight takes d7, bishop takes e4. Suddenly black is the one attacking. The knight has all sorts of discovered checks. I have no way to continue my attack. Clearly, his queen is coming into the game. His pawn on d3 looks pretty strong. I don't want this to happen, that's for sure. My knight on f6 is not only a good attacking piece, it's a very strong defensive piece. It guards g4 and e4 while attacking the rook on d7. Now is the time for me to simply recapture. Patience. It's important to be cool under the attack. King takes f3. You might not want your king to be so far up in the board in a crazy position like this, but he's perfectly safe. Again, remember, queen takes f3 is the same big mistake. I allow his queen into the game. Queen d2 check. Notice, even when we're attacking, going after the guy, we've got to look out for every chance that he has. King takes f3. He played d takes c2. So now I had to find a way to finish the game off. Obviously, it's very strong for me. I'm attacking his rook on d7. Notice if he had played a quiet move, like rook c7, getting out of the way, I could simply play c takes d3, I'm up two pawns, my f and g pawns are huge, I'm around his king and he has nothing to do. I'm just completely winning. He saw this and tried to mix things up. After d takes c2, there's a new element to the position. Black is thinking about moves like queen takes a2. Just trying to get closer to my king. After rook takes queen, he'll make a new queen on c1, 
and then try to play moves like queen f4 check, he'll be attacking my rook. That's what his idea is. The pawn on c2 isn't dangerous unless I let it be tactically. White's a move, what do you do? Simple. I took the rook. Knight takes d7, and he played queen takes a2. Now, you've almost got the game and the tournament won. Take a minute. Find the best move. Calculate it all the way through. White's a move, what would you do? I began with knight takes e5, sacrificing a piece back. I'm going after his king still. He played d takes e5. What now? Two things win. I played the simplest. Something else was good too. White to play. What do you do? It's important to be the most accurate when you're closest to victory. If I play moves like queen h4, trying to attack, he can make things complicated by sacrificing his bishop on e4. My king can get drawn to the center. There's no need for that. One interesting winning move I had was to take advantage of the relationship between my rook, queen, and his c-pawn. We see that if I take his queen, he wants to make a new one. But if I were to be able to guard the c1 square, I could just take the queen. So I had the interesting option of rook f6 check, throwing the rook away. After king takes f6, I would play queen b6 check, and no matter what he does, I can guard c1. If king g5, I simply play queen e3 check, followed by rook takes queen. If king f7, I play queen takes b7 check. And then if he goes to f6, I play queen c6 check, followed by rook takes a2. And if he goes to g8 or f8, I play queen c8 check, followed by rook takes a2. So rook f6 check was a nice tactical way to go. Notice, of course, that if he goes back to g8, what was the idea for me? I just follow his king, rook f8 check. Then if he goes to h7, queen h4 is mate. And if he takes on f8, I play queen c5 check, followed by rook takes a2. So this was one way to win. And it's a little bit instructional. Whenever there's a strange tactical relationship, for example, his queen is hanging, but he wants to go to c1. He wants to make a new one. One way is to trust your opponent, but the other way is to calculate and find a problem with it. In this position, he's hanging by a thread, and I can take advantage of it. But I played a simple move, queen takes c2 which wins very easily, and he resigned. The point is that he can't stop mate. I'm attacking his queen. The only move would be to play queen takes a1. I would play queen c7 check. And he's got to go back. If he goes to g8, queen d8 check, king f7, rook f6 is mate. If he goes to e8, rook h8 check will be mate. And if he goes to f8, do you see what I do? Same as g8. Queen d8 check, king f7. Rook f6 mate. So after I played queen c2, he saw that it was forced mate and resigned. So in the beginning of the game, my opponent made some moves which weren't so good. He tried to mix things up, made some strategical decisions which were less than correct. I've noticed that when we're closest to our goals a lot of the time in whatever we do, we tend to try to control the end of the journey. Whether we're playing basketball, if you watch these games in the final four of the NCAA, or or playing chess in a big game, trying to become a grandmaster, working for grandmaster norms. Sometimes the inclination is, when you're closest to your goal, to try to make it happen by force, to try to control the end of it. But the trick of it is that the, the way you got so close to your goal was by playing moment to moment, by taking life or the game or, or the competition or the sport, whatever it is you're doing, taking it as it comes. For instance, now I'm trying to become a grandmaster, working in these very, very difficult closed tournaments against all grandmasters and international masters is the psychological inclination when you're very close to your goal, close to winning the tournament, close to getting the Grandmaster norm, is to make it all happen by force. And you have to play within yourself. You have to play the same way that you did to get there.